Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, we were running and saw bodies everywhere. Days of killings, months of massacres. Survivors from the Darfuri city of El Ganina tell Human Rights Watch of a blood-chilling campaign of violence against the Masalit people amidst Sudan's year-long war. Also, Kenya enjoys its first full day with doctors on the job. There's relief to the millions of patients who suffered through months of limited health services that were crippled by a national strike. Also, deforestation, poaching and even pylons. Kenya's birds of prey are increasingly falling victim to encroaching human activity despite conservationists' best efforts. But first... Sudan has been rocked by war since last April. And as the army fights the RSF paramilitary forces throughout the country, the region of Darfur may have seen another genocide 20 years after its first. 15,000 people are feared to have been killed in the city of El Ganina. In a harrowing investigation, Human Rights Watch has collected stories of survivors who faced systematic execution, persecution and abuse by the RSF. Masalit peoples were mainly targeted. They were the victims. Uh, they were amongst the victims of genocide committed in Darfur during the 2000s by the RSF's predecessor, the feared Janjaweed. Researchers said that even the tens of thousands of people fleeing the city weren't left alone as Arab militiamen hunted them down and meted out torture and murder. Jean-Baptiste Galopin is one of the authors, the report's authors. Jean-Baptiste, thank you so much for coming in. Um, it was a, a harrowing read, undoubtedly far worse to have experienced. What were people telling you? So, you know, we went to the, the camps in Eastern Chad, the refugee camps, where uh, the vast majority of the population of uh, the Masali population of Algenina fled, uh, almost the totality of, of the Masali from Algenina. We couldn't find anyone who didn't have uh, stories of seeing uh, people they knew being killed or surviving a, a massacre. Um, you know, El Genena is, is a city that was hosting a, a large Masalit population. It was the center of the Masalit uh, people. And uh, during the 2000s, many people were displaced from villages outside uh, into the outskirts of the city. And then they were attacked again in 2019 to 2021 in renewed waves of attacks after the UN uh, withdrew a peacekeeping mission. And what we saw from late April until mid-June last year and again in November were repeated waves of attacks by the RSF and allied militias against Masalit majority neighborhoods, but also against sites hosting displaced people. And the number of people who were killed is unknown, but it's uh, certainly at least thousands of people, uh, if, not, if not more. You know, there were, there were already thousands of people killed on the 15th of June when a very large scale massacre happened. You know, the RSF and militias opened fire on a convoy that was kilometers long uh, of people trying to flee the city all at once and killed vast numbers of people, including, uh, you know, women, children, older people, injured people, you know, people who were trying to swim across the river and so on. And as you said, many people were targeted again on the road to Chad. So we concluded that these, um, these atrocities represent war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, we believe that uh, we haven't come to a conclusion on, on genocide, but we believe there is a possibility it may have happened. And we're calling on states uh, to investigate and prevent its perpetration. We also think it's very important for states who uh, are parties to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court to support the work of the ICC and its investigation on Darfur. So it's mind boggling that there is not more attention being paid to this. I mean, particularly bearing in mind that, you know, this is a community What the roots of this go back such a long way. Is there no lessons that have been learned from that first genocide in Darfur in the early 2000s that you think should be applied to the, inter to the, the response of the international community to what you refer to in your report? Unfortunately, the international community learned the wrong lessons of the events of the 2000s and, 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 and subsequently. Uh, the uh, peacekeeping mission that was a joint UN-African Union peacekeeping mission was seen by many as a failure. But when it started uh, withdrawing, we actually saw renewed attacks. So it was very clear that it had a deterrent role and actually that it was serving a kind of protection of civilian role. But unfortunately, right now, there's been no concrete discussions at the UN of uh, uh, how to protect civilians. And the UN Security Council has failed in its responsibility to prevent further atrocities. So we're calling on the UN Security Council uh, to uh, urgently deploy a mission 
uh, with uh, a mandate to protect civilians in Sudan, starting from the areas where they're most at risk of attacks and uh, with a strong policing component. Uh, this one is of those areas, actually, I mean, how does what you've learned from what happened uh, in El Ganina affect, you know, fears about what may be happening around El, El Fasha, another city in, in Darfur? So our fear is that uh, we may be witnessing renewed large-scale attacks against civilians in the context of what looks like a looming battle for El Fasher. And El Fasher is a city that is, you know, two, three, four times the size of El Ginena. We don't like, we don't have uh, concrete figures, uh, but it's certainly much bigger. There's hundreds of thousands of displaced people there who were there before the war started but who've moved again uh, since the war started last year. And uh, we're very concerned that the similar pattern of attacks could occur because the same forces are involved. They are rapid support forces and allied militias have mobilized. And uh, we, we, we are hoping the international community will react and, and do what it can to protect civilians. Jean-Baptiste Galopin, thank you so much. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Jean Galopin, there, the author of a Human Rights Watch report on uh, some potentially uh, harrowing... Um, rights abuses that have been conducted in Darfur in Sudan. Well, now this report from Clem Valla on some of the dangers faced by the city of El Fasha, as referred to by Jean-Baptiste just a moment ago. El Fashir is the last city held by the Sudanese military in the North Darfur region. Fears grow about an imminent massacre as the Rapid Support Forces paramilitary group edges closer to the besieged regional capital. Neither food nor medicine can make it through, only one hospital is operational, and, unable to flee, civilians live with the specter of famine. Activists warn an all-out urban battle would cause enormous civilian bloodshed. The RSF has already been accused of atrocities elsewhere in a new report by the Human Rights Watch NGO. It blames the RSF and allied militias of ethnic cleansing in El Jenaina in West Darfur, where Masalit and other non-Arab communities were attacked between last April and November. Hundreds of survivors reported witnessing abuses like torture and rape, as well as mass killings. About eight militiamen appeared wearing RSF uniforms. There were others with them from these well-known Arab militias. They were arguing with people. They stopped cars. They opened fire on us. They shot at the chests of men, women and children. The militiamen said, we'll kill you with knives. Your town is dirty and we want to rid it of you. There were children among them. He took off my robe, threw it on the ground and searched me. After they took what I had, they grabbed my sister Fatima and they beat her and beat her. For more than a year, Sudan has been trapped in a violent power struggle between the army, headed by the country's de facto leader, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, and the paramilitary rapid support forces, commanded by his former deputy, Mohamed Hamdan Daglo. Since then, the civil war has resulted in thousands of deaths and the displacement of over half a million people, mostly from West Darfur. A Boeing 737 crashed during takeoff at an airport in the Senegalese capital, Dakar, on Thursday morning. Only a few people were injured, but airport operations were just temporarily suspended. However, the incident is the latest in a series of controversies surrounding plane manufacturer Boeing. Sam Bradpiece reports. This, fortunately, was not a deadly incident. The Boeing 737-300 was accelerating, preparing to take off at Dakar's Blaise Jiang Airport when it veered off the runway, taking substantial damage and eventually catching fire. All the passengers were successfully evacuated, but there were 11 injuries, including four seriously injured. This puts further pressure on Boeing, which has seen a number of safety issues in recent years. Just the day before the accident in Senegal, a Boeing plane had to crash land in Istanbul after its front wheels failed to deploy. Back in January, uh, a Boeing plane operated by Alaska Airlines saw one of its doors blown out mid-flight. And in 2019, a Boeing plane operated by Ethiopia Airways crashed, killing all 157 people on board. A whistleblower working for a major supplier to Boeing recently told journalists uh, that parts often left the factory with serious defects. 
Boeing itself has yet to respond to this latest incident in Senegal. Now, after 56 days of strikes that left millions of Kenyans struggling to access health care, the government signed an agreement with a major doctor's union, the Kenya Doctor, doctor Kenya Medical Practitioners, Pharmacists and Dentists Union, union KMPDU, represents more than 7,000 members who had stayed away from work at public hospitals since mid-March as they called for better pay and conditions. Livia Bizo tells us more. After nearly two months of strikes, Kenya's medical practitioners, pharmacists and dentist union has signed a back-to-work agreement with the government. A labour court gave both sides 48 hours to reach an agreement, and if not, it said they would impose a solution. This will bring a huge sense of relief to millions of Kenyans across the country who've been struggling to access healthcare services in recent months. But although the KMPDU has gone back to work, other unions, including Kenya's Union of Clinical Officers, have not. The clinical work is one that gives the direction in terms of how to address any condition or any, how to take any intervention for any, any patient. So today, when we talk about the number of staff who have gone back by virtue of finalizing on this, they may be able to make an impact, but it will not be good enough to, to actually propel services or rather guarantee services for every Kenyan by virtue of the smaller number that they have. This isn't the first time that healthcare workers in Kenya have gone on strike. Back in 2017, they went on strike for 100 days. Eventually, union leaders signed an agreement with the government, which addressed a lot of issues, including a maximum number of working hours, promotions and, of course, pay. But during these strikes that began in March, healthcare workers have been saying that seven years after they were promised, these changes still haven't been registered or implemented. They hope that after this strike, that will soon change. And staying in Kenya, birds of prey play a vital role in ma maintaining the environmental health of their natural habitats. But Kenyan wildlife sanctuaries are struggling to protect raptors from the increasingly disruptive effects of humanity. Clem Valla tells us more. He is obviously in pain and not feeling very happy. But This short-tailed eagle is being treated for a wing injury at the Soy Sambu Raptor Centre. Located in Kenya's Rift Valley, the sanctuary is part of the Soisambu Conservancy, a reserve dedicated to protecting the country's dwindling wildlife. According to a report published by the Peregrine Fund, the continent's raptor population has fallen by 90% over the last 40 years. For the manager of the centre, it is too late to save certain species. Um, some species are on such a precipitous decline that it doesn't matter if we do put in those conservation initiatives, they will go to extinction. We're too late. There is, there is a sort of a critical point whereby a species on a decline slope cannot be pulled back. There are many reasons for the raptor decline. Deforestation, cattle farming, superstition, or the proliferation of power lines across the continent. For many vets and technicians working with the animals across the country, education is key to their survival. We have to convince people that not only are they absolutely gorgeous, but also incredibly useful as well. We can see a lot of change in attitude. We can see a lot of uh, reception has changed with how people view raptors. And Kenya is a major tourism destination famed for its wildlife. The country is focusing its efforts on preserving popular draws such as lions or elephants, but far less money is spent on the protection of raptors. That's it for Iron Africa for now. Thanks very much for joining us, though. And do so again if you can. Till then, take care.